You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. All right, guys, today we have a mailbag episode. We've been collecting your questions, your comments, your feedback, your ideas. We're going to be presenting it on the show today. And to help me with this, I have my co-host, Brad, here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I am doing quite well. Yeah, what's uh, what's going on in your world? Well, I was flexing my DIY muscles uh, and oh. our wash machine broke. And to be honest with you, like, I don't know if you as a homeowner, but I think most homeowners... And to a lesser degree, renters can identify with this fact that when your appliance breaks, especially an appliance like this, you have like a a countdown timer to be able to DIY this, at which point you're going to be going to get this thing replaced, right? (laughs) So it's like, all right, I've got 48 hours or 72 hours or until we run out of clothes to figure this out, at which point my wife is going to insist that we get this thing replaced because we're not going to go without a laundry machine for, you know, a month. (laughs) Or so. <laughs> yeah, I oh, I definitely feel that we've had, <laughs> had more appliances than I care to count. Uh, kind of break down on us, unfortunately. Actually, very recently with the uh, dishwasher. So yeah, I feel you. But so, was there a point where you're like, okay, am I going to call someone to fix it? Am I going to replace? Because right. there's this fine balance right. there, right? Right, 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 right. So you know, we're I went to the local bank recently, and we're having a local coin shortage. So, you know, one of the options is how long can we can we use our neighbor's laundry machine? Can we find a place? How many quarters do I have left? You know, that sort of thing. I was definitely running through the options of what we were going to do. But at some point I was like, all right, let me just see. Let me just see if I can fix this. And it starts with, all right, we have some sort of like speed queen, I think is what it's called. Let's go ahead and go to YouTube and see like how many YouTube videos there are around speed queens. And you know what? Wait, came, what is a speed queen? Well, it's just a, it's oh, that's just, the I mean, name. Of- I, it's just a type of washer. I think okay. I got it right. I think someone somewhere will recognize a speed queen is a is a brand of washer. It's an older one, but it's it's a pretty well known. I'm trying to think who would Maytag made. You'd know like Maytag, right? I don't know. Sure. Sure. And you know, I'm diving into this. It was binary. Did it work? Did it not work? Now it doesn't work. So I got to go farther. All right, what type of washer is it? And so, anyways, YouTube came back a little bit uh, the mixed results, but I, there was a very specific part that broke that I was able to find, and it was relatively easy to access. And I was able to get the part number off that piece, and then go back to YouTube with that additional part number, or go to Google with that part number, and basically find that what had broken was something called a lid lock, and you know, it's like a safety mechanism where when it's during the spin cycle, et cetera, the lid stays closed. You can't get in there. So water doesn't get out, et cetera. And I was able to identify the part, find out how to open it up to access and remove the part. And then I was able to order this very specific part, identify it, order it separately, get it rushed delivered. So total cost around $25, $6 for the part, 20 something for the shipping. Mm -hmm. It was there within two business days, two or three business days and got the thing repaired and it actually worked. You know how normally when you start a project, like you start one thing and then there's like six other things that go wrong that you then have to solve for. It's like, you're not, this was not one of those cases. It was a relatively linear process. And at its core, it was, you know, ask a better question, get a better answer. So I was super encouraged about the possibilities with the DIY approach and excited to share this with you guys as my personal little win here. Wow. That's very, very impressive. And yeah, like I was kind of jokingly alluding to before, like there's this continuum of, oh man, this appliance broke. It only costs, in the case of whatever, like a dishwasher in my case, it only costs 400 to 500 brand new to get it installed. It's six years old. What do I do? And you hate to waste things, right? Like you hate to throw out something that has a lot of useful life in it, but it's going to cost a hundred bucks to get a repairman in. You know, if this is outside of my scope, then it's okay. A hundred bucks just to get somebody in the door. And that's already 20 to 25% of the cost of the thing brand new. So, I mean, we agonized over this and we, it's funny, we actually went the route of 
getting a repairman in the house. So we paid the hundred bucks and unfortunately it really wasn't fixable for a reasonable price. So, you know, again, you make decisions in life, right? Like we made the best decision we could with the information we had at the time in hindsight, we threw away hundred bucks, but we couldn't have known that. So, you know, it is what it is, but yeah, that was, I'm very, very happy to hear about you actually having a DIY success. That's very impressive. Pulled that one down. Uh, it's a continuum here, as you pointed out, and and going to having that repairman and finding that person. But I, f- I feel like a lot of new homeowners, when they first encounter this, it's their first home. One of these big appliances that they had when they moved in goes bad. And one thing that's offered to new homeowners, and it's just kind of, a, I'm curious your opinion on this genuinely, is the home warranty. This is a product or a feature that is offered or sold. Uh, maybe sometimes it's given as a courtesy to new homeowners when they buy, and it basically says, This is a one year, I believe the way it's usually phrased is it's a $500 deductible and uh, it costs you 50 bucks a month. We're giving you the first year for free. And if any of your appliances go bad, then we'll replace that particular appliance. Did you as a new homeowner ever have one of those or ever consider getting one of those? We did get one with our old house like 15 years ago. So yeah. It was always a mixed bag. I always was like running the math on this and being like... (laughs) If I pay for it, then I'm definitely not going to get my money's worth. If I don't get it, I'm going to regret it. Oh, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, it's tough. It it really is tough. Right. And I'm with you. I ran the numbers on that. And you have to assume that it's akin to insurance. And if this company, this home warranty company is like a nationwide company, they're not going bankrupt. Right. Like they've been in existence for years or decades. That's how I always looked at it. It's like in totality, I'm going to lose here. I don't know. I might get lucky in the short term. But again, like we're not here, at least the way I approach life. I'm not thinking short term. I'm thinking, okay, over a long enough timeline, I'm going to lose on this. I might get really, really lucky if I had the warranty for a couple of years and maybe my HVAC system craps out and I I get a new quote unquote free one or something. But yeah, I mean, I think in total you're going to lose, especially because as you said there, like that $500 deductible, that to me, I think is the great equalizer for this. Yeah. And maybe, maybe there's some variance. Maybe you can pay a hundred bucks a month or 200 bucks and not have a deductible, but here's the the larger point. And and we're going off into a kind of different (laughs) direction. We'll we'll reel it back in. I promise folks, the insurance company has, (laughs) the insurance company has done the math. They've done the math and they have the benefit of scale and numbers. They're not losing money. Now let's pivot this slightly and let's go to the life insurance. I feel like people when they, and life insurance is an easy one to pick on, especially whole life insurance. Cause there's a lot of people that feel like whole life insurance is a good investment. Like the insurance company is doing you a, a big favor. And this is something that is going, you're going to make, you know, you, look how profitable it will be for you. And I'm just want to just, just take this as a point of reminder. It's not fundamentally different than this home appliance warranty. They're not losing money. They're not losing, but they wouldn't stay in business if they did. Now you could say, well, there's a whole different types of life uh, of insurance, you know, and there's a whole different types of insurance outside of life insurance. There's, there's car insurance and home insurance. And, and there is some nuance there kind of like, we can't afford the liability, you know, that, that would be your, like the health insurance scenario. Like, well, there are so many unknowns that could happen. Like that's when you start adding a lot more nuance, but when it's like a mercenary perspective, look how I'm going to win. Look how I'm going to win with insurance. You're never going to win with insurance because they've done the math and they win. That's why they're in business. They're not in it to lose. It's a zero sum game. So the only reason you get insurance is to not lose. When you start looking at insurance as a way to win, you've already lost. You've been tricked. Yeah, I would have a a slightly, ever so slightly different take, though not, not totally dissimilar, which is I can totally agree that in totality over millions of members, the life insurance company is winning, right? They have a very smart team of actuaries who are figuring out how can we get X percent of profit margin, et cetera. And that's fine. They're a company. They're more than entitled to have profit, right? Like that's what we do in a capitalist society. But, you know, from my perspective, it's like, okay, if I can spend $400 a year on capping my downside, if I do get hit by a bus, right, then that's a contract that I'm entering into with eyes wide open, hoping, hoping and praying that I'm not going to get hit by a bus and my term life insurance policy is going to expire. I will have spent my $400 very happily every year for the next 30 years. And I walk away alive and happy in 30 years that, you know, that contract ended expired. So I think, right, Jonathan, I think there's that, that little bit of nuance that, that everybody can win. Right. And I know that my downside is capped. 
Right. So you're saying it in a much more friendly kumbaya sort of way. <laughs> but but I did I did point out at the beginning of this the difference between whole life and, oh, yeah. and, and yeah. term. So when I was focusing, I was definitely putting the emphasis on whole life because with whole life, people are thinking about the great payout they're going to get regardless oh, no. of the That's outcome. Silly. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's selling. <laughs> so they're trying to win. So, so yeah, if you're looking at insurance as a <laughs> way, not like, win. <laughs> you're not going to win. You're not going to win. Universal life, some sort of life with some sort of annuity on the back end. You're not going to win. They've done the math. You're losing. I promise you, you're losing. Now, <laughs> again, what you're saying is you're caveating this, but, but I don't want to lose, right? If I have this outlier event and I die inside of a 20 year period of time, I want my family to be taken care of. So I'm willing to hedge that best, even though it's likely that I won't get that payout. It's likely that I'm paying. It's in the very unusual circumstance where I do pass away within the next 20 years that then my family is covered. That That is a different framework than look how I'm going to take advantage of these insurance companies because they can't do math. <laughs> no. Yeah, you are spot on. Spot on. <laughs> no, for sure. And yeah, to me, it's just, and I'm sorry, I missed your distinction on the, on the front side. You're absolutely right on whole life and all that other nonsense. In the end of the day, that's a sucker's bet. But yeah, I, I think about insurance in terms of just catastrophe downside, right? Like, why do I have health insurance? I have ultra, as you well know, we have ultra high deductible. It feels like we're throwing money away and not getting a whole lot. But if I have a heart attack and it's going to cost $500,000, well, my downside is capped. So that's why that makes sense for us to have health insurance. That's why it makes sense for me to have life insurance. So, you know, again, those are things you go into with eyes wide open that, okay, this is what I'm paying. I understand it. I'm not happy about it, obviously, but you know, it is what it is. So yeah, it's cool, right? Cause there's always this, this little bit of nuance and we all like, again, as long as we're making decisions from a place of, okay, I understand how this works. I understand the rules. I understand what, you know, even down to the home warranty. I get X, but I've got to pay this amount per year. I've got to pay that deductible. If you determine that makes sense for you, go for it. That's fantastic, right? It is. It is. And, and you can extend this to, uh, this is an experiment to do with everything. Your cell phone insurance. Do you think they haven't done the math? Your mm -hmm. appliance insurance. Do you think they haven't done the math? You know, you're not going to win on this one. So, mm -hmm. all right. It's how much risk can you bear? How much risk can you tolerate? And certainly on a hundred dollar phone, a $300 phone, whatever it is, you can tolerate the risk. That's the way that we look at it. So <laughs> this was a tangent and we want to encourage you or invite you to, uh, create your own tangents, start your own tangents. And one of the ways that you're best able to do that is by being on our newsletter and replying to Brad's weekly email. So Brad, let me uh, hand this over to you. If someone wants to get your once a week newsletter and submit a question or comment or feedback for us to go on a tangent about, what is the best way for them to do that? <laughs> yeah, I guess, uh, well, a couple different ways. I guess chooseify.com slash start. If you put your name or email in there, that that's kind of our, our general start page for chooseify. The very direct way for this is just chooseify.com slash subscribe. But either way, we'll get you there. And yeah, like Jonathan said, this is really like, aside from this podcast, Jonathan, this is the most fun I have all week in terms of like just creating content is I sit down really sadly, I'm, I'm kind of last minute every Monday and write this email. It goes out Tuesday morning. And yeah, it's just, it's the five weekly as we call it. It's just like a couple quick hit thoughts on what I've been exploring, what's going on, some quotes, interesting little money saving hacks or tips. And then a whole bunch of feedback from the community, which I literally source by saying, hey, hit reply with what are your wins this week? What 1% action did you take to make your life better? So yeah, it's really, it's a lot of fun and, and it's cool just getting these emails every single week from the community of, wow, these are the four things I did this week. Or in some emails I get like, oh, Jonathan, honestly, like a laundry list of like a dozen things. Like here's everything we've done in the past month to make our lives better. It's, it's really, really inspiring. So yeah, anyway, I do read every reply to those emails. So yeah, just get on that list at chooseofit.com slash start. And we thought we would use that as the inspiration for today's episode. And we have curated a few of those uh, replies that we've gotten in the very recent term. And we thought that we would share those with you and use them as a springboard for a conversation. So Brad, where should we start? All right, Jonathan. So actually, uh, speaking of a, a huge list of wins, I actually got this email from Jamie and Jamie said, last year, a client of mine, I'm an independent hairstylist, referred me to your podcast. It took me a few months to open it up and listen. But once I did, I was hooked. I felt like I was taking a personal finance masterclass. My husband and I had a rudimentary understanding of finance and it started to snowball our debt and budget about a year ago. But this podcast leveled us up. So since last July, we have all right, there's 15 things here, John. Oh, wow. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna try to read them real quick. I'm trying to write them down. <laughs> 
decreased our homeowner's insurance twice. So I guess they've called up twice since last July, decreased our car insurance payment, our internet payment, dropped our gym membership because they were able to find creative workout solutions at home. We fully funded our emergency fund with a goal of 15,000 bucks. We paid off my husband's student loan debt. We paid off our minivan and then sold it and bought a more reliable one for cash. Nice. Refinanced their house, said thanks and goodbye to our financial advisor, transferred our IRAs to Vanguard, putting the money into VTSAX, fully funded our IRAs for the first time in 2020. Wow. And we should hit 100,000 before the end of 2021. Wow. We, yeah, they, they're rocking it. They signed up for three Chase credit cards and got the sign up bonuses for future travel plans, snowballed our debt. And then she said, My husband took a job with the state and is getting some of the best benefits and pension in the country, set up an account on personal capital, which has been really helpful, and finally became a spokesperson for your podcast behind my chair and turned at least one client onto you. How oh. cool is that? I passed along the Simple Path of Wealth book to this client who is now hooked. How cool is that? That is amazing. Wow. Congratulations on all of that action. And <laughs> yeah, that is not like an aggregation of marginal gains. Maybe any one of those would have been a thing, although all of them are pretty respective in their own right. But together, that's a life transformed, <laughs> man. In one year. Oh, actually, it's funny. I, I just saw Jamie followed up and said, as a side note, our kids have heard us talk so often about FI over the past year that our seven-year-old in second grade was randomly talking to his teacher about it. And the teacher... <laughs> apparently was aware of the five movement and couldn't believe her son knew about it too. We're trying to start our three kids with a better financial understanding and foundation than the one we had. Wow. When you get started early, man, it's, it's really unbelievable. I mean, when I think about, and we'll, we'll talk about more of these, but just let's look at the stack that, that we just talked about, that we just looked at there. We decreased multiple line items on most people's expenses. So spend less, absolutely crushed it. If you look at the optimizations they made on the invest side of the equation between looking at, you know, low cost index funds and maximizing tax advantage vehicles, their investing better strategy has just skyrocketed. And when you realize that you have like these three different aspects that we have control over, we can earn more, we can spend less, or we can invest the difference. When these all become, they, they stop being this cloudy, dark box of mystery, but instead it's very concrete, obvious things that we know to do. And when we have a question about any one of those or the tactics that would serve us in a particular situation, we have a clear community that we can go to and say, all right, for me, what do you think, how should I best implement this? What should my next step be? And you have very clear examples of people that have done this in front of you. You completely crush the game of life. Absolutely annihilate. It gets easy. It's so hard to win the game of life if you don't know the rules. And I feel like for me personally, I did not know the rules as a young adult, as a teenager, certainly did not know the rules and was not given that as a kid. The extent of what I had was just like, you know, avoid debt, which is, you know, it's not bad. It's some people don't have that. But when we really are crystal clear on what your options are and how powerful they are and you start taking action, you can just make this game of life borderline easy. Yeah, I hear you. I, I mean, to really dive into this, Jamie's email has a little bit of almost every single thing that we talk about. Right. And her and her husband and their family have done this in one year. Mm. Right. This is fully accessible to anyone listening to this podcast. If this is the first time you've heard of FI or choose a FI and you're wondering, where do I get started? You can cut expenses. Right. You can get new income. Her husband got a new job. You can teach. We call it second generation FI. Right. You can teach your kids a little bit about finance. So I know, Jonathan, you and I didn't didn't learn about personal finance when we were growing up. And now our kids are going to know about it, right? A little bit about community. She's talking about now she knows her son's teacher is into FI and her client is now into FI. It's so much easier to go through life when you have a community. Better investing, right? Low cost index funds, the importance of compounding and fees with the getting rid of the investment advisor. I mean, goodness, this literally is FI in a nutshell in one email. So this is truly remarkable. Hey, this is Andrew from the Choose a Fi team. I hope you're enjoying the show. We're going to get right back to it after these quick messages. And Brad, you know, as we were looking at that framework, we just mentioned the earn more, the spend less, and the invest better. And we really, as a show and a platform, we try to spend our time, you know, bobbing and weaving between these three and making the clear connections that are provided when you have a little bit of space that being on the path to Fi affords you. If we 
focus on the earn more. I know you got an email about salary negotiation. And just because I know how high impact this has been for the community, I'd love for you to share that. Yeah, this was a cool one from Sandy. So Sandy wrote in and said, after years of asking for a raise and getting no more than 5% at my annual review, I finally decided to dust off my resume and see what was out there. I was offered a job at a competitor that pays 35% more wow. plus a sign-on bonus. I would have never had the courage to negotiate my salary and benefits if it wasn't for ChooseFI. This new income will speed up our FI journey by a lot. Thank you so much for your inspiration and the everyday courage that you give to so many of us. Mm. Congratulations. That is so cool, right? It is. It's scary to take that step and go find something new. It's uncomfortable to do it, but the rewards are there for those that are willing. Yeah, I totally agree. And this was something that would have been completely outside of my comfort zone as well, Jonathan, without any question. And until we had, I guess we had a couple of different guests on who talked about this. So we had the financial mechanic on episode 211 and we had Tori Dunlap on episode 147. So if you're listening to this and you're thinking, you know what, this is outside of my comfort zone. I would never think I'd be scared to negotiate. Well, financial mechanic and Tori Dunlap gave, they literally gave scripts, right, Jonathan? They gave the exact wording to use and it made sense. It's win-win. It's almost like, hey, if you're a reasonable person and you're sitting on the other side of the table, you almost can't say no to it because it's so reasonable. That's what, what I thought was just so cool about that. I mean, we've gotten probably at this point, well over a hundred emails from people saying, I use those exact scripts and I got a $5,000 raise, 10,000, whatever. I mean, I've seen 20,000 plus, no joke, no hyperbole. Yep. And I mean, that's what's so cool about this. And Jonathan, the other one that's kind of tangentially related, let's say, was Chris Hutchins in episode 121R. And I know you, that one intrigues you, right? How to get any job. Yeah. So l let's just point out the nuance of what actually happened here. So there's two aspects. There is salary negotiation inside your current job. And that's what Tori Dunlap and Financial Mechanic were talking about. It's also what ESI, Earn, Save, Invest, uh, talked about in episode uh, 23 of our podcast. All of these would be valuable for people that inside their current role are interested in salary negotiation or are not pivoting outside their industry, but maybe you're going across the street to another employer to get a counter offer, that sort of thing. These would be very, very effective tools. But I wanted to point out with a scenario where we are dusting off our resume, we're dusting off our resume very, very specifically, we're changing industries. There's a space here before we get to salary negotiation. And Chris was handling that in a large degree, but I think we can even fill in the gaps a little bit of what Chris was saying. Chris was saying, you can get any job but you want to be a little bit creative so that the aspects that we need to solve for, if we're pivoting an industry and we're going into a new career, a new job is one, we need to work on our personal branding. So in this case, dust off the CV or the resume, build up our LinkedIn profile, you know, figure out what, how is it that we're branding ourselves to the, you know, to employers. The next aspect of that is what is our job application? So, and I want people, as you think of these, you write these down, if you're going to, each one of these are skills that can be built. And it's probably not going to be buying the latest version of Kaplan's, you know, resume book and just trying to make yours look like one of those. Nobody actually cares about your resume being eight pages at this point. But there is an art craft to getting one that grabs attention uh, and makes it makes its way through filters, right? That are definitely being used. So personal branding solve for that. Two, what is the job application process? What how do I get good at that? Right. And there is an art form to that. There are people that are very good at identifying, clearly identifying jobs that they would be eligible and be a great fit for. And I would say one of the biggest lessons that I've learned uh, watching Bradley work with the Talent Stacker program is that a lot of people see a job application. And when they're looking at what the requirements are, they write themselves off before they've applied because they don't have all of the requirements. And Bradley's really powerful feedback to me on this, and I've benefited from actually seeing this proven out, is that job requirements are a wish list. They're a wish list. They're usually copy and paste. They have nothing to do. They might not even be realistic. And so many, many times what Bradley says is you should shoot to have 60 to 70 percent. 60 to 70 percent of the requirements you do not need to have all of them so when you're screening jobs don't let the fact that you don't nail everything on there keep you from actually applying and then 
the next layer on is we're still not at salary negotiation. We've got personal branding figured out. We've got the job application process figured out. Now we need to move on to interview prep. And I actually want to, just for a second, and this is kind of, I was building all around this, even before we get to salary negotiation, talking about interview prep. And I want to quote Justin Ducks. He actually works with Bradley inside the Talent Stacker Career Development Program. And this was a comment that I saw him just post today. And I literally marked it because I wanted to share it with you guys because I got so much value from it. And I want to have him on the show actually to talk about this at a later point so we can flesh this out even further. But he says, I talk to a lot of job seekers who think that job offers are factors of merit and experience. So when you hear that, think about a really long CV that meets all the requirements. I no longer think that after helping 100 well-qualified entry-level candidates with zero prior experience get job offers. Confidence is the combined effect of preparation and storytelling. When you could put both of those together during a job interview, the hiring team ends up creating a huge space called grace. I don't teach people to lie, to con, to fool, or to make up fictional experiences. We reframe, explore, and emphasize the experiences that they do have to confidently be able to say, I don't know, but let me tell you what I do know. It's like selling lemonade to adults that want you to succeed. You only need to be honest and assertive about who you really are, and they see the potential in you that they once saw in themselves. So Brad, you know the power of preparation and storytelling. Like, think about that. The power of preparation and storytelling and being able to, if not control an interview, to guide the conversation. Yeah, that was really powerful. I don't know, but let me tell you what I do now. That's pretty cool. Because that is guiding it to where you want it to be. And it plays off of your strengths and what you can add to the organization. I think, I think that reframing is important in any type of job interview. Because it might show also that you're someone who's going to put in the extra effort, right? Yeah. You're going to do, do the research. You're going to put in the time that's necessary. And hey, I might not know it today, but A, I've got a whole list of things that I do now. And B, I'm going to put in the effort that's needed to learn that. So Again, if I was sitting on the other side of the table, that would be uh, a pretty eye-opening thing for me. And I know with a lot of these individuals that we're talking about in this scenario, as part of interview prep, if there was something that you didn't know, you would guide the interview by telling them what you did know, but then you would likely go back after the fact, research what you need to do, and then you would come back to them with the email and share them what you would do with the benefit of a little bit of research, confirming for them that you're the type of person that can get an answer quickly if you don't have it. So you can just imagine the difference between one person goes in on the basis of merit and expectation of what their experience means. And the other person goes in with personal branding software, with understanding the job application process, and now with significant interview prep where they're going in ready for this, either because they've done multiple interviews and each time they keep sharpening their skills or they're working with individuals to do mock interviews ahead of time to really get in a good place. And now with the benefit of all of that, now you're ready for salary negotiation if you want to employ this. You know, is this a starting role or is this you pivoting out of one industry and into another? Depending on what your background is, you might be flexing it uh, more or less. But I'll just tell you, if you're building on that level of foundation, I now from personal experience have talked to individuals where they had no experience. They were nervous to salary negotiate, but they had done everything else so well. They were working with this company that was their dream company, but it was around a 40 minute commute. They had offered them a lot more money, almost double what they were making before but they were looking at this long commute and they said to them, this looks like my dream job. I really want this job, but to be honest with you, you know, I, I have a couple other interviews going on right now. And as much as I really want this one, the 40 minute commute is, that's gonna be a bear that I, I don't want to take. So I, let me ask you this, what I would ask for, what I wanna know if you'd be open to, cause I really would love to work for you, is would you consider making this a remote position? Would you consider making this a remote position? If you were gonna make it a remote position, you're my dream company. I would love to work for you. So this was going into a Friday or a Thursday, Friday, didn't hear anything over the weekend, you know, and you're, you're like, oh, did I shoot myself in the foot? They came back on Monday and they said, we are so desperate to have you on the team that we would like to make you our first remote employee, our first remote employee. We've never had them before. We don't have any other ones, but we are so desperate to have you on the team. Person with zero experience and background in this new industry, but are so confident about you because of the foundation that you laid. We'd like this to be a remote position. That is entirely possible. And you can move, if you, if you look at this as like a life strategy and build a foundation for this, you can replicate these results. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. And I don't know if I've ever talked about this or if I've ever told you about it, but when we moved down here actually to Richmond, though this is going on, I guess, 15 years ago, and working remote was not really a thing. When Laura, my wife, went into her accounting firm to tell them, hey, we're gonna be moving to Richmond, 
I'm putting in my two weeks, they actually scrambled and said, we do not want to lose you. Maybe we can work this out where you can work from home. And I mean, she literally was the first person in the history of that accounting firm to work from home at all. And they figured, what's the downside, right? If we find out it doesn't work, then okay, no harm, no foul in essence, right? Because they were going to lose her anyway. She's moving 400 miles away, but why not try it for a high performer? And I think that again speaks to it never hurts to ask, right? And that's what's cool. You know, it's funny, this ties directly into Jonathan, just yeah, though you did not realize this was going there, but it ties directly into the next email that we got from George. And George is saying, I loved episode 335 about not choosing life's cookie cutter options and thought it was pretty relevant to an unconventional choice that I just made recently. I decided to push my current employer to let me do a 32 hour work week instead of 40. Ooh. My wife and I recently had our first child and I'm finding that when you have a child, you cut back time spent on hobbies, seeing friends, exercise, <laughs> personal time, <laughs> time with your spouse, basically everything you do. <laughs> you yeah. could keep building on that list. Yeah. It could just keep Sleep, going. <laughs> personal care. <laughs> and George and I, except I was still working a full 40 hour work week. And the 32 hour work week is definitely an unconventional choice, though I don't understand why more people don't do it. I get a lot of weird looks from my wife, family, friends when I tell them what I'm doing here, but they all say, man, I would love to work 32 hours a week, but I just can't afford it. And then he goes into some detail here and it, I think it's relevant. So I'm going to, I'm going to read it word for it. He said, when I tried to negotiate 32 hours a week with my last employer, no, that's the key word here. They offered a 28% pay reduction for 20% less time. Not ideal, right? They were taking advantage of me here. So I started replying to LinkedIn recruiters and said, I'm only interested in their job postings if I can work 32 hours a week. Many said no, but one said, yeah, that's fine, but it would mess up your benefits package if you weren't classified as full-time by HR. It's easier if we just give you a normal full-time salary, even if you work four eight-hour workdays per week. So now I'm working 20% less or 0% less money. Wow. How amazing, right? That's the power of FU money, he said. I'd done all the math above for the 20% less pay scenario, but it turns out it didn't even matter. This has now supercharged my path to FI. Wow. So maybe there's someone just now that had like a gut reaction, like, wow, that that's so unfair. That wouldn't work for my employer. It didn't work for his original employer no. either, yeah. but it's not to say, you know what an employer needs? They need the work to get done. They need the work to get done and getting the work done is worth a certain amount of money. There's an ROI that's implicitly calculated into that work. So other employers appreciate that and realize that. And so if you can leverage your understanding of what your ROI is and value is, and that lines up with what an employer's expectation is, everything else is just a calculation, right? It's just a, a rounding error. Like it's semantics. I think Brad, you left your job when they told you you had to be in your cubicle at a certain hour, <laughs> a very, very specific hour. And I'm sorry, employers, like that's not going to work for people in the five community as they get farther on the path and they start realizing what other people are doing and, and being able to pull off. They're going to look for greener pastures. They're going to look for more flexible arrangements. And I don't blame them. I would too. Yeah. That's the beauty, right? Is you have power. You're not beholden to the absurd whims of someone else because there are other options. There are plenty of other companies out there. In my case, that was really the push that I needed to go out on my own with my own entrepreneurial journey. So, I mean, that was, that was something that really worked out well for me. And yeah, I mean, it, it's just, it's really cool to think that we can do unconventional things, right? There is this one cookie cutter way that everybody thinks but there are so many options out there, especially if you're a high performer, if you do the work, Jonathan, like you said, right? Like if you're getting the work done, in my case, it was all of a sudden, even though you're the top rated person in the department, yada, 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 you do all this work, it's now FaceTime and you need to come in. I think it was at eight o'clock instead of 8.30. It was just this arbitrary decision for no reason whatsoever. I mean, that quite literally was the straw that broke the camel's back. I just, I was not going to do that. I would have like died on that rock of like, <laughs> I can this is see it. I could totally visualize I will it. not do. So <laughs> it just, yeah, it felt very arbitrary. So uh, it's funny. We have a, another email here, Jonathan, about similar kind of unconventional thinking. And, and this actually ties into 
our Red X month concept, which, you know, we will explain a little further, further detail for people that are unaware of it. But Corey wrote in saying, I really took the Red X month to heart. Ever since I started my firefighting job, I've taken more and more consecutive time off each year. This year, I'm happy to say I'm taking nine consecutive weeks off this fall. Wow. In addition to taking a break from a high stress job, the residual effects are even greater. Since I am strategically utilizing my leave, my wife was able to switch from staff nursing to being a travel nurse and doubled her salary. Wow. Doubled her salary, Jonathan. How crazy is that? And then he goes on to give some detail about uh, taxes in, in Florida and how this is going to be really advantageous for them. I'm not sure of the details, so I'm not going to read it word for word. But he also said, I also took Jonathan's podcast course, which uh, people can find at talentstacker.com. And after getting off to a hot start, life intervened, and I will be using this time to ramp things up and get my podcast out to the world, in addition to relaxing on the beach every day in Florida. <laughs> Thanks to you and Jonathan for what you all do. It has truly changed our lives. So as you're saying that, I, I put the connection together and Corey and I are probably just, I'm probably a few years older than Corey and we actually went to the same church in like oh. middle school or high <laughs> school, right around, and we overlapped for a few years there. And then it was like, literally a decade or two later i'm trying to think how old i am now so it's somewhere in somewhere <laughs> that range so let's just say around 15 years Numbers or so are ticking up. Corey messages me on facebook and he says dude i've been listening to your podcast for like a year and i just realized you know that we knew each other 15 years ago and went to the same went to the same church in the same uh church group so it was uh, one of these total small world things here but it is it's really cool to see the the phi you know just this phi community spill over to your real life as yeah. people are so open and really wanting, feeling that need to share it with others because not, not out of any sort of selfish reason, but just because it's just, you have more time. You want your friends to have more time. You want to share just the impact that these ideas, these concepts can have and it can have in a really, really short period of time. Once, once you see it. Yeah. Agreed. Just to kind of close the loop since uh, you know that that bothers me when I listen to other podcasts. So the red X month, just real quick. So that actually, it's funny when this is going out, Jonathan, you and I are both on our Red X month. So we're recording this at the, uh, the tail end of July actually right now. But basically it's a concept that Vincent Puglisi put in front of us a couple of years ago where you just look at the calendar and instead of letting your job or whatever, you know, in our case, this podcast, Choose a Vi, overtake your life, you say, all right, let's take an entire month and just put a big old Red X through that entire month on the calendar and just say, this is family time. This is me time. This is whatever. This is my life. This is not everything else. So you and I are both taking August off, which feels fantastic, right? So we're, we're doing a little extra work here in July, but it is, uh, it's just really a really powerful concept to take control of your time. I think, you know, aside from the, the cutesy thing with the, the big red X, like that's really at the heart of it is taking control of your time and not letting everything else bleed over into, oh, I'll do it someday right? I'll do that travel someday. I'll do that project that I wanted to do someday. You know, someday has a way of never happening because the every day kind of just keeps rocking and rolling. It doesn't, it never stops unless you make it stop. And that's why that's the power of something like Red X. So in Corey's case, it sounds like nine weeks off and his wife is uh, doubling her salary. So yeah, it sounds like they've got some pretty cool stuff going there. You know, speaking of having time and time off, Brad, I know you had saved this uh, this post in our Facebook group to share talking about just talking about a restoring a car. And I think it's tied so nicely. I'd, I'd love to kind of give you the floor to, to, to share why that resonated with you and also share it with the community. Yeah, Jonathan, this was cool. This I've been saving this for a couple months now because uh, it just was really powerful to me. So a guy named Brad, actually, back in February, posted this in the Facebook group and got I think it's a couple, 3,000 likes, 3,300 hmm. likes. And he said, Phi gives you options to make personal decisions. In high school, my dad bought me this car. Years later, I sold it to him when I went off to law school. 15 plus years later, he gifted it back to me. She'd been sitting all that time. I made the decision to restore it with him now and not later. So I started buying parts. We went over budget a lot, but the memories of wrenching on her with my dad these past three years will only grow more dear as he gets even older. I had the money because we'd saved for years. I had my dad. It just made sense. So here she is, the most valuable thing I own, and she will never be for sale. Save, but spend when it brings you value because you can't take it with you. 
holy cow. I mean, even reading Jonathan, I've read it like 20 times and I still get chills. I, Same I, here, it, dude. Same it's here. Incredible. I think I might have a single tear. I didn't think <laughs> it was like that. Yeah. And there's a beautiful picture. I'm not a car guy, so I don't know. I need to look at the comments to know ex- precisely what car. I don't want to get it wrong. But uh, we'll link this up in the show notes for sure. And man, that car is a thing of beauty. Yeah, that's gorgeous. And you're, you're totally right. That time in is absolutely everything. And I think that's like a common pattern that we see is people in this community sharing how being on this path allowed them to make choices to prioritize family both their, their kids and their parents in many cases. Brad, I know you were sharing with me. I doubt you have it pulled up, so I won't ask you to quote it word for word, but someone was, was taken with that time that I was spending my dad on a weekly call and kind of holding each other accountable on something and was saying they had mirrored that with their own parents. Yeah, it's really, it is cool to see this. And I think a lot of us, you know, we get into our, our routines, right? And I think that's where realizing and and what hit me recently was reading that article the tail end it's on mm. wait but why we talked about that a couple years ago but it's a really remarkable article here by this guy tim urban it's a fantastic site wait but why i know it's paula pant's favorite site i think it's one of our other good friends favorite sites and, and it, it shows in visual representation basically how much time you have and you know where you are in terms of the number of weeks you have left and I think what's especially meaningful for me is, especially with my older daughter being 13 now, is looking at the amount of time she will have with us, with Laura and I. And the quote that really jumped out to me was, so quote, it turns out that when I graduated from high school, this is Tim Urban saying, I had already used up 93% of my in-person parent time. I'm now enjoying that last 5% of the time. We're in the tail end and it's, it's sobering on the one sense and it can, it can kind of bring you down on on one level, but then you look at a post like Brad's with his car and this time that he spent with his dad and say, it doesn't have to be that way, right? We can really maximize the time. We can make more time, right? You don't just have to be resigned to, oh, I've spent 93% of my time with my parents by the time I'm 18. You can carve out real time and it it doesn't just have to be your parents. Like I just saw a post on Facebook from an old friend who was hanging out with her parents and and I realized I haven't seen them in 20 years. These were people that I used to spend a ton of time with. They were really important in my life. You never know when that last time you're going to see somebody is. So it just, it's a a long way of saying you got to really maximize it. You got to treasure these moments because truly you don't know when they're going to come to an end. And again, I don't mean that in a negative or morbid sense. I mean it in, in the most positive way of FI is about maximizing time. And it's about looking at, hey, we get to determine how we spend our time. So I choose to look at that in a very positive, powerful way. Yeah. Very, very sobering. You're not promised tomorrow. You only live once is correct as long as you don't make the incorrect assumption that that just means that you should buy as much stuff as possible, (laughs) right? Like time is your most precious non-renewable resource, your time on this earth. How do you want to allocate that? How do you want to spend that? And I would just remind all of you, you were born to do more than pay bills and die. Brad, let's close the loop again. I went through the comments. I didn't immediately recognize it. It's a first generation Camaro. Ooh, very nice. Thank you for closing the loop. I appreciate it. I think we have an episode title. Right. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. This is fun, Jonathan. I like doing these roundups. It's amazing all this uh, the community feedback. I think uh, I think we might do another one in the very near future. I'm I'm totally game. So I hope people take us up on the offer. If you would like to participate, if you want to share your wins, you want to ask an open ended question, get feedback from us from the community. Let me encourage you just go to chooseify.com slash subscribe and you'll get Brad's weekly email and his open offer just to send us your feedback, your questions, your ideas, commentary on the show. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled.